One of the greatest things about NextAuth is just how easy it is to get started, especially if you're using it in the T3 stack. All you need to do is paste in your environment variables and you're fully working off. But if all you've been using is use session on the client and get server session on the server, then there's a couple of features and advanced patterns that you're missing out on. In this video, I'm gonna look at a couple of those. The first thing I look at is probably the single most important thing you need to know about auth, not just NextAuth, but any type of auth. Then we'll look at a common misconception people have about performance with NextAuth. And finally, we'll look at a couple of different ways of doing auth on the front end. The audience for this video is people who have used NextAuth before. So if that's not you, then I think the NextAuth docs are excellent, but also you can initialize a T3 app and just take a look at how we do our setup there. Once you've given NextAuth a try, come back and watch this video and I think you'll be able to get a lot out of it. So I hope you enjoyed this video and let's get started. Let's take a look at the demo app that we're gonna be using for this video. So the landing page is quite simple. You can sign in. And once you're signed in, you see that you are signed in and you also see a secret message and you can sign out again. And then at the bottom, there's a couple links to different pages and each of those contains one thing that I want to show during this video. The first thing I wanna show, and it's probably the most important thing in this video, is that auth needs to happen on the server. There's a lot of nice things you can do on the client, but ultimately, if your auth isn't happening on the server, then you don't have auth. Let's take a look at what I mean by that. So here I have two procedures. One, get secret message is a protected procedure. That means there needs to be a session in order to be able to use the procedure. The other one is called get not so secret message, and it's a public procedure, which means that anybody can access this procedure. Now, in the front end, I can do something like this where I don't enable the procedure unless there is a session. However, that doesn't actually protect anything. So let's, for example, switch this to get not so secret message. And now we can see the not so secret message doesn't show when we're logged out and it does show when we're logged in. However, if I look here in the network tab, I can take a look at this procedure and copy paste it, sign out, open a new tab. And you can see, even though I'm not logged in, I can still access the data from this procedure. Now let's see what happens when I try to do this with the procedure that's protected server side. So I'll change this back to get secret message. And then when we sign in here, we get the secret message. And now while I'm logged in, I can access this from a different tab. But if I sign out and refresh here, then I get an unauthorized error. So this is super important. You need to do your auth on the server. If you don't, anybody can change some user IDs and get data that they're not meant to be allowed to get. The second thing I want to show is to address an anti-pattern that I see a lot. People get the session in the front end and then pass it down to components, and that's really not necessary. Let's look at why. If you look at the app.tsx file, you'll see that you have a session provider here, which takes in a session. Now, if we take a look at this in the next auth code base, we have this function session provider, and we don't really need to look at all the stuff it does here. The main important thing is to realize that this is a context provider. So the session exists in context. The second thing we can look at in the next auth code base is the use session hook. And the important thing to see here is that we use use context to get the session context. And what that means is that if we use the use session hook in several places throughout our app, we're not gonna be making one network request for the session per use session hook. Instead, we're gonna make one request to get it. And if the session is not stale, then every other usage of the hook will just get the session out of context. And I think you shouldn't worry about it and just put the use session hook wherever you need the session, even if that's multiple different places in your app. You can really reduce complexity a lot by not properly the session everywhere. To show this in another way, I've prepared this file. So we have two components here that each call use session and then display the session. And we start off by showing the first one. And then after two seconds, we also render the second one. So if each instance of the use session hook would make a new network request, then what would happen is we'd make one for the first use session and we'd make a second one for the second use session two seconds later. But let's go and take a look at what happens. So let's refresh this page and you'll see we get a 304 and a 200. Now the 304 isn't a real network request. If we look at MDN, we can see that Firefox DevTools use a 304 in the network tab to show cache access. And the actual request is the 200 here. But more importantly, we can see we get one 200 when the first item loads in, but we don't get a second network request when the second component loads in. And that's because the second one just gets the session out of context. Now, obviously this is an extremely contrived example, but the lesson here is that the way you use the use session hook should should not be to optimize for the fewest number of calls, but rather just use it the way that fits the structure of your app the best. 
Now that we've got the conceptual stuff out of the way, let's look at a bunch of different ways to protect a page. The first one is the required property in the use session hook. From now on, I'm going to add a two second delay to the callback that gets the session so that we can better see what's actually going on. Now, what the required property does is if use session runs and the user is not logged in, it by default sends the user to the login page. It also has this on unauthenticated function where you can implement your own logic that overrides this. So I can go to the require page and it loads just fine. However, when I sign out and go to the require page again, you'll see that we're redirected to this login screen. Now, require runs client side, so that does mean that when we refresh the page, we need to wait until we get the session first. Now, one thing that's important to understand about require is that because of how JavaScript bundling works, it doesn't provide full security. So it is gonna prevent somebody from using your page. However, for example, here I've put this super secret message just in a P tag. And now if I refresh on the require page without being logged in, and I open this part of the JavaScript bundle, you can see that this is in here. So while require is a nice way to check for the session client side, it isn't a fully secure solution. If we don't want the user to see some HTML when they're not logged in, then we have to protect that HTML on the server. And that's where the other authentication options come in. So let's look at get server side props. Here we have the code for a page that uses get server side props to get the session. So get server side props runs on the server, and that means we can use our get server auth session function to get the session and pass it into the front end. Now, there's one really big misconception here, which is that because we're returning this as props, we'll have access to it here. And it's not made any better by Next.js's lack of type safety. So if we hover props here, you'll see we get session and this other foo variable that we're passing. But let's see what happens when we actually load the page. And you'll see only foo is locked to the console. Why is that? Well, the results of get server side props aren't actually passed directly to here. What they are passed to is the initial app component. And you can see what we're doing here is we get the props, we destructure the session from it, and we stick it into the session provider. And then we only pass the remaining props down to the component. So that means we're putting the session into the context, but it's not actually available as a variable in the server side rendered page. The solution to this is to just call the use session hook again to get it back out of the context. And as I said before, calling use session is not actually expensive at all. And so if, for example, I comment out this use session, then you'll see we don't actually have the session here. And it's not in props either, as we just saw when we looked at the console log. So when you use get server side props to get the session into a page, follow it up with a use session call. We can also look at this in the context of the require function. So what we could do here is uncomment this get server side props block, which is the exact same one as the page we were just looking at now. And now when we visit the require page, the session loads in immediately. And we can see that when we reload the page, the first thing we receive is HTML that already has the session information inside of it. Now, getting the session in get server side props is really nice, but there's one more thing we can do, which is to redirect if the user is logged out. So while signed out, we can click the get server side props redirect link and we'll be brought to a login page. And there we can sign in. And then we're brought to the page that we originally wanted to go to. And the way this works is quite simple. So let's take a look at the get server side props function here. And you can see first we get the session. Then all we do is if we don't have a session, we return redirect. And an obvious place we could redirect to is just the index page. But if you take a look at the next auth docs, you can see that there's a nice way to redirect to a sign in link that has a callback URL so that the user will be brought back to where they were before they signed in. So we've looked at a couple of different ways to do client-side auth when a page or a component loads in, but what if, for example, you have a mutation that fires when a user clicks a button and you're checking server side whether the user is authenticated and if they're not you want to redirect them somewhere after they click the button. NextAuth itself doesn't actually offer you much in the front end there but if you're using TRPC then there is a nice pattern that you can use. So let's take a look at a simple example of this. For example here we have a button that fires a mutation and we're currently logged in so if we click the button you'll see here all that happens on success is the word mutated logs to the console. Now let's see what happens when we're not logged in. So while not logged in, we can still see the button, but if we click on it, we once again get redirected to a login page. Let's take a look at how that works. What we're doing here is using the on error property of the mutation. So if the mutation returns an error, then we check if the code is unauthorized. And in that case, we push a new URL to the history, which is the URL of the sign-in page. And of course, you could also push any other URL such as the index page. Additionally, if we're using the default React query settings, then we also need to write a custom retry function. 
React Query by default retries queries and mutations several times if they fail. The default for this is four times. However, in the case of being unauthorized, we probably don't need to make that request four times because the user is still going to be unauthorized. So what we do is that if the code is unauthorized, we return false, which means don't retry. And otherwise, we only return false if the count. So the number of retries we've done so far is over three. Now there's one more way to protect our pages, which is middleware. But in order to use it, we're gonna have to change a few things about our setup. Specifically, we'll need to use JWTs. Switching to JWTs requires two changes to our next auth options. The first is to explicitly use the JWT strategy. The other thing we need to change is the session callback. So until now, I was using basically the default session callback from Create T3 app, with the only exception being this console log and the two second sleep but now we can comment that out and instead use this session callback, which works with JWTs. So basically what this callback does is check for the subject on the token. And the subject is commonly used in JWTs to identify who the token belongs to. And it places that on the user's ID and then returns the session. The other thing you need to protect routes in middleware is a middleware.ts file. So if you're using Next.js with the pages directory, then the middleware.ts file goes outside of the pages directory. So right into your source directory. And what you can do here is export the default NextAuth middleware, and then you need a matcher for it. And the matcher is just a list of routes that you want the middleware to run on. Until now, I had it running on no routes at all, but we can change that to number one, the route that we want to protect with the middleware. And I've just added another arbitrary one here. So now that we've done that, let's see how it works. So if I'm signed in, I can click this middleware link and I'll be brought to a page that shows my session on it. And if I'm not signed in, then it will once again redirect me to the login page. And that's really all you need for a basic middleware implementation. So that was it. We talked about how auth fundamentally happens on the server. We looked at why it's okay to use the use session hook in many places. We looked at how next auth's data flows through the context provider. And then we looked at a couple of different ways to protect things client side. I hope these patterns end up being helpful for you. If you enjoyed this video, then be sure to give me a like and a subscribe. I also have a lot of upcoming videos planned, including my big guide to testing TRPC, as well as a few more videos leading up to React server components. YouTube is going to recommend you another video of mine. So if that looks relevant, then maybe give that a watch. And so thanks a lot for watching and see you in the next one.